Is this real life? Find out today on Human Factors Cast. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Nick Rome, Human Factors Guy, and I'm joined today by Mr. Billy Hall. Billy, I'm always joined by you. I mean, you're always joined by me. One of the joining of the thing. You know what? I'm just excited about today. Are you excited? I am. I hope everyone else is excited about today, because today, what are we talking about? But anyway, sorry, 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 sorry. No, no, no. We're always excited here to talk about Human Factors stuff. On Human Factors cast. Yeah. With Human Factors people in Human Factors everything. Yes, exactly. You doing all right, though? Everything great with you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You excited about No Man's Sky coming oh out tomorrow? Oh, my God. I, 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 I called my lovely fiance, Kia, and I said to her, Hi, uh, No Man's Sky comes out tonight at 9 o'clock uh, when we're recording this. And I'm not probably going to see you for three weeks, but I love you. I'll miss you and send me a sandwich or two. Yeah, you know what's happening is, uh, to our listeners, we're actually recording this on a Monday night because No Man's Sky, which is a video game uh, that comes out tomorrow Mm -hmm, for us, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for you listening, this is like two weeks ago, so this is old news, so sorry about that, but... We'll be sure to talk about it next time. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely. Because we'll have a much better perspective on the game and the universe as a whole, really. And that's the other thing. It's such an impressive undertaking. I mean, such a small team with Hello Games making such a monumental step in video games. Yeah, I mean, well, it's them developing the algorithms, really. Yeah, but... Well, yeah, it's the algorithm, if you want to put it down at the basic idea, but, I mean, this small team coming up with this idea and saying, yes, we can, that's very American spirit, even though it's not made in America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I, I realize no, that. It's another this kind is, of saying it. I mean, it's, it's great that, you know, you and I are so into video games, because what is today's topic? Today's topic comes from a listener question uh, that we'll get to at the end, but it's we're talking about virtual environments today, which is really exciting. Yay! Yay! I love, so, love, love, love virtual environments. This is actually the reason why I went to grad school to begin with, uh, was to get into virtual reality and to kind of learn about how humans interact in that virtual space. Right? You know, I mean, we, we had that revelation last that podcast about the fact that you never seen The Matrix, but, you know, a lot of things have been coming out about that. I mean... The success of that book, Ready Player One, which you should definitely read. It's on my list. Yeah, yeah, it's always on the lists. Lists, lists, lists. Yeah. But, you know, the fact that virtual reality is becoming such a major part of our, of, 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 of entertainment, you well, know? And augmented reality, too. But Right. Yeah. I we'll mean, talk about that, because I want to know what really the clear, concise differences between those two sure, are. Sure. You know, because, but it's so cool. I mean, I grew up with, like, Reboot and... And if I was in the game, you know, how many times have we yelled at it? It was like, if I had these powers, I would do this with it. Now we're getting close to the idea where we can maybe do, do that. You, do you remember, it was like early to mid-90s where they had that Johnny Quest reboot where they did like yes. the, They had that machine where they went into the virtual environments mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then they actually like 3D rendered... Yeah, the story, yeah, yeah, yeah. They even had, like, a bad guy that they fought in it, too. God, Dude, that was a great show. That My favorite part of that show was the intro. I used to sit. You know what <laughs> yeah, intro? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's yeah. all the green lines yeah, and yeah. The, the, the virtual landscape. I used to sit in a chair and pretend like I was flying through that every time that thing came on. I mean, we grew up with the earliest forms of virtual reality. I mean, just sitting in there on those plastic motorcycles in virtual front of the Virtual Boy? Do you remember Virtual Boy? I remember how sick it made me all the time, but I also remember Robot Fighter, which was awesome. <laughs> Robot Fighter. Ah, this is going to be a good show. It's going to be hard for me to not steamroll this into virtual reality, because we're talking about virtual environments today. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> what was that? No, no, it's just, I know, I know. And I I had that moment where I was like, virtual reality. Yeah, virtual reality, but then it's in virtual environments, which is still very exciting. It's cool. It's really cool. So there's, there's a difference between virtual reality mm-hmm. and virtual environments. And 
basically, let's let's go over what a virtual environment mm-hmm. is first. Um, now, what a virtual environment is is some sort of computer generated three dimensional and. This is a definition that I pulled from somewhere, and I have issue with it, and I'll tell you what my issues are in a minute. Okay. It's a, it's a computer-generated, three-dimensional representation of a setting in uh-huh. which the user of the technology perceives themselves to be and within which interaction takes place. Let's dissect this for a second. Okay. Okay. So first they say it's computer-generated. All right. So it has to be rendered by a computer. Uh, they say it has to be 3D. Uh, and then they also go in to say that the user has to perceive themselves in this environment, mm-hmm. and they have to interact with this environment in some way. Right. Let me lay out my problems with this. Okay, first off, it's computer-generated. Um, now, it, it just virtual... Yeah. The definition of virtual itself is like the essence of or... Uh, relating to, but not actually the thing, right? Now, that's not a technical definition. That's just the way I understand it. Right. So you could be virtual something, virtually something, right? But And, and it, it would have the essence of whatever that thing is, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't be the thing. So my, my problem here is that they, they define this as computer-based mm-hmm. and that it has to be three-dimensional. Okay, yeah. Would you not agree with me and please please speak up if you if you disagree okay, okay that something like super mario world would not be a virtual environment because by this definition it is not well it wouldn't be a virtual environment because Why we're would? not because the thing like you said it's not three dimensional right but is it it's still an environment that is yeah, but we're not in the environment. We're controlling a sprite within the environment. Right, but do you? When you're playing Super Mario Brothers, you can't tell me you have never lost yourself in the game and gone, "Man, I am Super Mario." Oh well, I mean like that and other games, of course. But I mean like, it's like looking out a window. I'm not outside. I'm inside. As much as I think that it would be awesome to be outside, I might be stuck inside. Right. So, well, the idea of a virtual environment is the same concept. It's the fact that I'm removed from the virtual environment. I can daydream that I'm there or lose myself within the story or the arc, but I still think that I'm not in a virtual environment. But then again, also, you're smarter than me. So, <laughs> Look, let's, so there's, um, there's a researcher by the name of Jim Blaskovich mm-hmm. at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and he does this TED Talk, and I believe he talks about it in his book, uh, for any readers that are, or for any listeners that are interested in reading this, it's called Infinite Reality by Jim Blaskovich and Jeremy Balenson. And they. We'll post it on our Facebook as well. Yeah, it goes through and they talk about how, you know, what is virtual reality. And one of the things, one of the points that Jim Blaskovich makes is that, you know, a virtual, virtual reality isn't necessarily. I, I'm, I'm going towards virtual reality here, but I'm abstracting to virtual environments. One of the things that Jim Blaskov- one of the points that Jim Blaskovich makes is that really anything that takes you out of where you are could be a virtual vir- is virtual reality, and by abstraction, I'm saying virtual environments as well. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you have um, if, if you're reading a book, mm-hmm. you're transported to a different world. Okay, I see what you're saying, but isn't that more of an artistic than a hardline idea of what it is? Well, look, here's the thing. For years and, and centuries and generations, we have been telling stories to put ourselves out of this reality and into another. Right. That's why we tell stories. Yes. That's why we go to the movies. Yeah. Watch movies, um, listen to the radio back in the day, stuff like that. Exactly. All I'm saying is... Uh, um, you know, based off Jim Blaskovich's point, is that simply being immersed into these environments, mm-hmm. the fact that they're not computer generated or three D based, mm-hmm. you might be able to um, abstract that they're a virtual environment because 
They're not. They're they're in your brain. They exist. Right. Just because they don't exist in pixels. Like, does that? Does... I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. But I mean, like, you're talking about the ideas of like virtual reality. We're talking right. about the idea of a virtual environment being in something, doing something, but isn't that the goal of virtual reality? What makes this different than virtual reality? So, virtual reality, um, so, let's see, the definition I have here, virtual reality is a realistic and immersive simulation of a three-dimensional environment created using interactive software and hardware and experienced or controlled by movement of the body. Again, I've already gone over my issues with these definitions. Right. In that I think that it spans well beyond uh, computer-generated graphics. Okay. And, and you know what, listeners? If you think I'm totally full of it, feel free to leave me a comment. I don't care. Like, it's, you know, it's here's okay. an idea of a thought. Here's an idea that you're getting across of what you're saying. A haunted house. Yeah. That, I mean, it's... That, I mean, it is not computer-generated. You are physically there, but it's supposed to transport you to a different place and elicit an emotion. Fear. Like... You feel like you're in a meat closet with a chainsaw-wielding maniac. You know what I mean? You you feel See, like you're in a graveyard. They try to put you in that spot. Right. That's that's really interesting. I, I don't know if I would consider that virtual reality, though, because it's... So it is transporting you somewhere else in your mind, right? You think you're there, but... It it's is three-dimensional. It is a physically constructed environment, though, and I think that's the difference. Right? So is a book. But you're not – so if you're reading, you know, a, a book and reading a, a description of the place that this character's in, uh huh, that's not physically around you. So you think the idea of the virtual reality, whether it is or isn't a virtual environment, is the fact of whether it transports your mind there or not? Yes. So well-crafted or not. So that old adage about the guy playing um, Missile Command – and it being about a nuclear strike, and after he created it, he kept having nightmares about it because it transported him there. Yeah. Is the same concept. You know, yeah. And so one of the points, I forgot to mention this too, that um, in that same TED Talk, he starts off with saying, you know, in an average minute, our mind drifts 16 times. What? Exactly. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, you know, I'll, I'll promise or I'll make a deal with you if you... Limited to eight, I'll only do it eight as well, <laughs> and then and then he goes like into that. it. But I mean, so that's 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 his point. But anyway, well, let's stick with the actual definitions for now, just okay. to avoid confusion. That was a little bit of a tangent for me to go off like that, but I think it's an important distinction to make. So anyway, the difference between virtual reality mm-hmm. and virtual environments, according to these definitions, right, is is and and widely accepted by the community, is that there's this sort of control-by-movement aspect in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So typically what people think of when they think virtual reality is this head-mounted display. Right. A pair of screens that you put on your face and you look around. maybe. Yeah. And and the act of moving your head controls your camera view in Mm -hmm. that environment. And so... You know, there, there are varying levels of interaction with it. You can Some systems have you move your hands. Mm-hmm. Um, some even give you tactile feedback, that, that kind of thing. So that's really the difference is a virtual environment is something in which you interact with but don't move your body to do. But there's really – this line is really thin. And maybe maybe you'll start to see this as we go on, right? So, but that's virtual reality. Yeah, I mean, like I remember, I remember the few times. I mean, I don't know if this is considered virtual reality or not, but I remember getting in those cockpits and doing those flights, or spending hours and days in a mech pod actually doing that because it was three hundred and sixty view. I can move myself around and look in the environment. I had the controls, I was moving my hands and doing that sort of stuff like a person, and it gave me force feedback. Right. Would you consider that a form of virtual reality? I would. Okay. Because you are, you're interacting with your body in a way that, um, you know, you're, you're moving your hands, which move the mech, mm-hmm. right? Right. Whereas if the, the virtual environment itself is what's relayed on the screen, mm-hmm. I think that 
is really what it comes down to, right? That the, there's this separation between the screen and what's beyond the screen is the virtual environment, and virtual reality is the placement of you, the user, into this environment. Oh, so you're, it's kind of like the idea of the zero point. I get it. Kind of like, um, well, it's kind of like that Google Street View type of thing where it takes you walking down the streets of Vienna, seeing everything like that, even though you're on pictures, you're not the physical person in that place. But it gives you a 3D view of what you would see on those streets. So if you used a Google Cardboard... Yeah. You'd put it on your face... Right. And you were to do a Google Street View. Right. That would be virtual reality. You right. You would be experiencing virtual reality, because you're looking around this place that you're not actually in. Right. It has transported you into another place. The environment, I don't know if it would necessarily be virtual. Yes, it's pixels. Yes, it's a picture, but it's a real environment that you're looking at. So that's mm. that's another fine line, right? Like, I, I could argue either way that it is or is not. Right. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments section below. I'd love to hear what our listeners think about I this. I do, too. I think this is a really thing. Uh, this is something very artistic that a lot of people can get involved in, which is exciting. It is. You know, and I mean, really, there's no right or wrong with this, but I mean, I mean, there's there's a clear space where it is, but there's not a clear space where it isn't. Does that make sense? Yes. But what is the difference between a virtual environment and a virtual world? Well... So a virtual environment, if you think about an environment, that's just, like, one sort of area that you can interact with. Right. Now, the, the virtual worlds, they contain virtual environments, and they're, they're kind of like this shared space between people. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they're kind of populated by a t a many users who have their own avatar and simultaneously but independently sort of explore this world, right? So think about things like Second Life. That would be a virtual world. Um, world of Warcraft. Virtual world, because okay. it's, it's shared. And so that's, that's the important distinction between a virtual world and a virtual environment. It's still a virtual environment, but it's a virtual world because there is more than one person interacting with it. Does that make... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more of a, the one versus the many idea, you know? I have a bunch of fruit, but not all of them are apples. Kind of idea. The virtual environment would be the apple, right. and the virtual world would be the fruit in that analogy. Yeah, That's yeah. a weird analogy. I'm sorry. But... Like, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's like uh, the one that you... Oh, uh, gosh, what's that analogy that they always say? Not all apples... All apples are fruit, but not all fruit are apples. There That's you go. the one that's I was looking it. at. That's it. Right. I get it. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, so... We can find... Where... Can we find virtual environments? I mean, like, what is the scope? Right. So, you know, virtual environments, I mean, they've exploded, obviously, since the advent of computers. Right. But we can find them pretty much in every application now. But some of the main ones that are really interesting are, like, education. Right. That was one of the ones I thought up, too, while I was looking at it, but... You were talking about the idea of the Google Street View thing. Like, for example, a lot of people take virtual tours right. of, like, the Louvre and, yeah. and, and Gettysburg and other places of significance. Virtual tourism right. is another thing. Entertainment with video games. Yeah. You know, Ready now, Player One, baby. You know, and, and to be fair, like, video games, all video games are virtual environments. Right. Virtual reality or not. I mean, we're, we talked earlier about No Man's Sky. One of the biggest things about that game is not the story or the characters or the bad guys in it. It's about the idea of exploring a virtual universe. A virtual potential. world. That would be yeah. a virtual world because there's multiple players interacting with it. Yeah. On a grand scope. It's and, really cool. Yeah, that's interesting because there's no guarantee we'd actually even meet anybody on it. Except you and I have plans to meet in-game. Oh, yeah. We're going to have coffee on what a nice you... little planet. What do, you, what do you think is at the center? Oh, me? I think it's a bunch of series of, like, gateways and wormholes to other parts of the world, of, of the universe. Really? I think it's the end game. I think it's literally, if everyone's trying to get to the center, that's the one place where everybody meets up. And who knows? There might be raids. There might be, like, something Wouldn't else. it be really funny if it's just a giant floating head of Sean Murray saying, welcome? I mean, 
I, I honestly think they want longevity to the game. Right. Right? You can only get so much by exploring and getting to the center. And it is on a server, right? Now, I wonder, I wonder, and they said, like, it's very unlikely that you'll run into other humans. Until you get to the center where everybody else is. Yeah, you, you're going to get there and you're going to see other people. I, now, I'm thinking that there's, like, some sort of end game there. I don't know what it is. It could be raids. It could be, like... You want to know what the scary thing is? What? We don't know if your weapons will work on me. We don't know if friendly fire is a thing or not. Oh, I'm sure it, I'm sure you can kill other human players. Can you imagine that, though? Think about it. You traveled halfway across the galaxy. You have spent immense amounts of time on your little cargo ship. It's not combat capable, but you've spent so much time on ferrying all this stuff and exploring all these things. You show up in the center. I come up with my raptor with two giant guns on the side of him and said, you're going to have a bad day. I mean, I was watching some streams earlier, and it doesn't look like... It looks like it's uh, like one of those games where you like drop your loot, and it's visible to you. Mm-hmm. And then you just like spawn at the nearest space station and go pick it up. But we don't know that. We don't know. We don't that, know. But we're going on tangents about No Man's Sky, anyway, which we anyway. will talk about more later. There's okay, so entertainment. To, there's yeah. There's more. There's video games, which is the entertainment side. Right, of it. right, right. There's other applications. We're talking about applications of virtual right. environment. Okay. There's also medical applications. Is which that are like the virtual like doctor who's like in Philadelphia working on kids in Brazil who have pancreatitis? That's virtual reality. Is it? Yeah, because those environments are are real. They're not. They're just telepre- ah, it's telepresence. Okay, 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 okay. No, I. Uh, there's a very specific example. I kind of want to talk about this a little later, though. So let's, okay, okay, okay. We'll there's talk about also it. commercial and social applications, but again, let's let's get let's save those Wait, for later. What kind of social app? I'm sorry. What kind of social app? If you say that it's a single person experience, what is a social application about it? That's one of the things that I actually had a question mark next to on my on my notes. Well, like we said before, all virtual worlds have virtual environments, but uh, not all virtual environments are virtual worlds. Gotcha. So things like Second Life, World of Warcraft, those are all social as well. I'm glad this is a uh, family podcast because there would be other questions I'd have, but I'll save that for another time. Okay, <laughs> maybe you can... <laughs> You can uh, ask me offline. Is it relating to Second Life and sort of the... No, uh, just virtual environments and social aspects. Oh, is this like Tinder? Like when we were talking about Tinder, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the uh, social oh, uh, social meetup or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what could, was it called? Uh, oh, uh, social ex- uh, social exploration? No. So, it was something. Like anyway. That. Anyway, too much. But what do you need to make a virtual environment? Like we've talked about the idea that a lot of things are these kind of broad terms, but... What is a virtual environment? What do we peg it down for? Right. So at the bare minimum, mm-hmm. um, for for like hardware, you need some sort of window. Okay, yeah. Right. So this could be the head-mounted display in virtual reality. Yeah. This could be uh, a TV. Right. This could be any sort of screen, that kind of... Uh, it, it could even be a speaker, mm-hmm. you know, if you're if you're listening to a virtual environment. Although... This goes back to my argument earlier. Let's just stick to what what everybody else talks about. Anyway, so some sort of window into this environment. Right? right. You also need some sort of input into this environment. So whether that be a keyboard and mouse, a game controller, um, or even, even a head-mounted display where it maps your movements of your head. Mm-hmm. You need some sort of way to interact with this environment. Right. Because um, then it's just a pretty picture. Right, right. You got it. And then... In terms of, like... So that's what you need from the hardware perspective. Obviously, you need a machine to be able to render these environments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And, and in order to produce them, you need software, right? And you need some sort of software that will allow you to create these environments, right? So whether that be Unity or Unreal or, um, you know, uh, there's Google SketchUp, which is a... Is I've never I, even heard of that one. Yeah, it's a... I mean, I think it's just called SketchUp now, or maybe it was SketchUp before, and now it's called Google SketchUp. I'm not sure, but okay. it's another way to make uh, virtual environments, and it's actually free software. So if any of you are listening and want to give virtual reality a shot, it's actually really easy to pick up mm-hmm. and, and create your own virtual environments. What's really cool is about um, SketchUp is that in my lab, 
when I was in grad school, mm-hmm. we actually uh, well, one of the one of the postdocs on campus, he actually built a program that allowed you to create a program or create an environment in SketchUp and um, port it into the head mounted display software, so you could just walk around any environment you create. So, literally one day, I was sitting there playing around with. Um, so in SketchUp, they have these libraries, right, that people have created these these cool 3D models. You import them into your docu- into your file. Mm-hmm. And so, obviously, I found everything pertaining to Star Wars and just tossed it, <laughs> tossed it all in one thing. It was really ridiculous. And, you know, not even 30 minutes later, I was walking around underneath the Star Destroyer and walking up into the Millennium Falcon. It was really cool. Oh, did, did you cry a little? Nah, because the headset and it was really oh, yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so really, that's that's what you need to sort of make a virtual environment. You need this hardware to look into it and to control it, and then you need the software side to produce the actual environment itself. Okay, I mean, like that's what you need to actually get into it. But what do you need to experience a virtual environment? Right. So the one missing component that I didn't mention before mm-hmm. is the person. Well, yeah. I that's, mean, that's what you need. Right, right, right. To experience it, you need to be a person mm-hmm. uh, that is the missing loop in that system. Right? So if you think about it in terms of a U, you would start at the input, which is the keyboard and mouse or the controller or whatever, and then that would go into the computer, into the software, mm-hmm. and then at the other side of the U, it would give you some sort of output on the screen. Right, right. So, but my input of reaching my hand out goes through everything, and into the output, it affects the situation that I have there. You got it. Yeah, and and the missing component with experiencing a virtual environment is actually the human, right? So once the human is in there, it becomes a loop, mm-hmm. right? So right, now right. you have the human that gives the input, that goes to the software, that goes to the output that the human then perceives and provides more input based on that output, and it's a forever loop. It keeps going forever. Ah, I like that idea. All right, but so how does this, how do developers develop this? What are some things developers have to keep in mind when designing virtual environments? So some of the things, like in in the case of virtual reality, and I'm trying really hard not to go super into virtual reality because that's a whole other show that we can get into. I'm excited. Um, I am too. Like I said, I love virtual reality. Uh, That's what I went to grad school for. Anyway, the uh, one thing that they have to be careful of is with virtual reality is like the limitations of space, right? So if you have somebody in the physical environment, right, Mm -hmm. and they're interacting with a virtual environment that has different temporal and spatial demands, Mm -hmm. right? So maybe not temporal. It depends on what kind of game you're playing or what kind of thing you're doing. Like super hot, that'd be temporal. Time. Right, 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 right. Time. Um, but like, let's say, let's say we're sitting here at the Human Factors Cast sound booth. Right, right, right. And I have a head-mounted display on. Uh huh. We're sitting at a desk right now. If the virtual re- environment demands of me to walk across the room, I can't do it because there's a desk in my way. Right. So, what what I've seen at least. Um, is this sort of invention of these experiences that sort of don't require the user to move. So you see these experiences where they're sitting stationary, like Mm -hmm. in a flying simulation. You're looking around the cockpit. You're not going to move from your seat because you're in a cockpit. It's confining you. Yeah, yeah. But you're actually moving the ship around, right? Right. Learn how to fly. Or uh, Job Simulator, the video game where you're in like a little cubicle or a little desk area. Doing you're not moving. Job. Yeah, you're not moving. You're not moving. I get it. I get it. I get it. You might be bending, doing things like that, but it has certain constraints. Right. Yeah. You're keeping the physical environment in mind with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So there's also, that kind of goes into my next point, which is limitations of body, right? You don't want to, you don't want to create some sort of input that the user has to do. Like, let's say there's a button 20 feet up on a wall. You don't want to have that in the virtual environment because your hand can't reach 20 feet up. Right. You have to design for the average human so that way everybody, or mostly everybody, 
can do these inputs, right? You don't want to, like, create something where your arms have to be six feet wide, and, you know, some people can do that, but other people can't. Right, like, um, one of the examples that I found online was talking about how Second Life was using a lot of people to overcome social or physical limitations that they would normally be judged for or nervous about in the real world, right? Like the yes. limitations of their body, or it overcomes their limitations of their body, so they can do simple things, so it does that. Would that also work on the other side of it? I don't know if that's necessarily what we're talking about here, but please bring that up when we talk about applications Okay, again. but you see where I'm coming from, I do. The idea. I do, I like, do, yeah. Is the limitation of the body also a granting factor of the body? Well, we're talking about what designers can keep in mind for mm-hmm. their... for actually creating these virtual environments. And Mm -hmm. that might be one thing that they want to consider depending on the content of the virtual environment. Right. But I I don't necessarily know if that would be like a primary concern. I get you. I get you. Okay. Um, Okay. There there are also other points that they have to sort of consider is something that is, um, that has plagued the virtual reality industry at least for, a while, which is cyber sickness. Yeah, I've always heard about that. You know, you get a little sick. Yeah. And like, moving around. A lot around. of that has to do with the um, the hardware demands, right? So the, the computers that process these environments have to render these things at lightning fast speed uh, based on your input, right? Like you move your head, and if that thing just lags even a little bit and your input sort of follows where your head goes, it's really disorienting because that is not how you perceive the environment. Right. So, you know, because of cyber sickness, these developers have to consider maybe downgrading the graphics a little bit for the computer to run it a little bit better. They also, I mean, you know, they also want to create these situations where maybe they're not moving so fast. Maybe maybe it's just a viewing thing where they're where they're looking around instead of like a first person shooter mm-hmm. which is really fast paced and you have to be really aware of your environment and you have to use your head to shoot and so when you're moving around all over the place it causes disorientation right. so these these are some sort of things that they have to keep in mind now what about the nose situation i've always heard about this problem with that with uh, vr sickness and them being like if you have a nose in it it helps a lot is that a thing like i always hear about noses like, being able to focus on your nose keeps you right? So, I haven't heard about the nose, but I have heard of... Um, so, there's there's this concept... And, you know, a lot of virtual reality research is still in its infancy, so this this is still up in the air. Right. But there's, there's research that suggests that if somebody can see out of the bottom of their virtual reality headset... Mm-hmm. Right, that they can still, uh, they, they'll get less sick because they kind of know where they are in the physical environment too. Oh, right? I see. They can perceive everything. So our our senses, which our senses are crazy, and that's a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So there are these little balls in our ears that roll around, mm-hmm. um, and they're in sync with what we see, right? And so. You're talking about things that give you, like, the lack of it gives you vertigo and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And so so the idea is that if you can see the ground and it's in sync with what your the balls in your ears are doing, then, you know, you're more, you're less likely to get sick. Mm, 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 mm. But there are other things that you have to consider. Let's get back to the... I'm sorry, sorry, no, sorry. it's okay. It's easy to go off on tangents on these. Another thing we have to consider um, when designing these environments is um, how sort of multimodal inputs uh, interact when they work together. Multimodal? Yeah. So a modality is some sort of input. Right. Okay. Uh, so like... A mode. Y- yeah. So I, I, I'm going to interact with this virtual environment by moving my head. Right. Or I'm going to interact with this virtual environment by moving my hands with these controllers that track my movement. Mm-hmm. Using both of them together would be multimodal because you're both interacting with, oh, you know, kinesthetic. I and see. Yeah. You're also interacting with, you know, your your head. My hand is front of my face. I see it with my eyes. I feel it with my face. I'm touching my face. Right, that aspect alone doesn't make it multimodal, but the fact that there's two ways that you're interacting 
with the environment mm-hmm. does. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, I get it. So what developers have to keep in mind is that, you know, sometimes these things don't work together. So if you're if you're playing virtual reality with a keyboard and mouse, right. you can't necessarily understand or you can't necessarily see the keyboard so you don't know what you're pressing. Right. Same thing with a gamepad. But if you had these hand controllers, right, then then it's only a couple buttons on either one of them and you pretty much know where you're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like how we have on the Kinect and the um, PlayStation camera and everything like that. HTC Vive has it as well. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Those kinds of things. Uh, and then the last point I wanted to make is that presence um, is a big one. And now presence really sort of dictates the success of the virtual environment. Mm-hmm. So, do you know what present? Do you know what I mean when I say presence? No, well, I would just think showmanship or or the look of it, like the look or the idea of being in a virtual world. No, like it, the artistic side of it. I was thinking it was like that has a bit to play with it, but what presence actually is is, is it's like um the feeling that you're there. Okay, when you're really into a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Presence is high because you're like all those people I'm who so freak out this. in horror novel, uh, in horror simulations, because they they feel like they're they actually there. Feel like they're there. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a big one um, for the success, anyway. I, at least in my opinion, right? So, you know, if if you don't feel like you're there, and truth is, it doesn't take a whole lot. Mm-hmm. But the more presence you can create, the more convincing the environment will be to whoever's experiencing it. That's crazy. There seems to be a lot of facets that people go in as designers. Oh, yeah. I mean, There's... a lot of things that people... I, it makes me a little scared when people are starting to going to start using things like Unity and stuff like that to make virtual assets and not actually considering it. Because, let's be honest here, there's some really bad games out there. there are. Or bad uses of the practitioner. It almost seems like it will become like an app store type of idea. I hope not. I mean, I mean, like surgery, you'll be able to do like surgery or heck, even online classes, but quality is going to be the biggest thing. Yeah, I really hope, you know, developers keep in mind that there are, there is a lot of things. And, you know, the trend is, I think that they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there, there are some solutions at like the software level that have really advanced this along. So in Unity, for example, I've created virtual environments in Unity um, that take a look at visual illusions, which is really cool, using, uh, you know, an Oculus Rift. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, like, it, it, they make it so easy because all you have to do is put a camera in there. Right. And that camera will, um, you know, automatically calculate the inner pupillary distance, which is the distance between the two pupils in your eyeballs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll automatically calculate you know uh, the differentiation in the frames like it it does this automatic it's just one component you don't have to be like there's here's these two things uh so secretly what you're doing is you're playing mind games with people's brains you know what in in this specific one i was because i was creating an illusion Uh, so god when will you use your powers for good and not evil nick I was getting at some fundamental underlying of how we process visual illusions. So, yeah, and yes, Scarecrow that's... was just trying to figure out how to conquer fear. All right, all right. Fair enough, fair enough. But go on, go on. No, I'm sorry. Go on. No, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Oh, you're done now, huh? Okay, I'm, fine. I'm done. But you're talking about the idea of making illusions. I mean, we talked about the idea of doctors. I want to get back onto the idea of the media and the entertainment of it. The applications of this virtual environment. Right. You know, I want to talk about that. Okay. Like, what are... I mean, like, we talked about education first. Though. Right. Okay, yeah. So let's get into education. So, um, one, you know, one major movement right now that I'm actually really happy as a thing is uh, they're using Minecraft to teach kids how to code. How? Redstone. What about it? It's logic-based. They're basically programmable logic controllers that allow you for automation through. Um, it's no. I thought it was. I coding. thought redstone was just like a like a, an optic, like a. I mean, I'm not an optic. A circuit, like it's just circuitry. That's coding. Oh, that's all that coding is. Ah, oh, hell, I can coding. I can make a lamp. <laughs> I mean, coding is. I don't want to simplify coding and say that it's basically doing that with 
Yeah, we have a fan language. base to think about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've done coding before. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same idea. You have a little bit more flexibility with different languages. Mm-hmm. Um, but that fundamental, like, if I do this, then this happens, that if-then logic is the basics of coding. And so teachers in classrooms are using Minecraft because it's a virtual environment, because it's a game, right? because it's easy for kids to get behind as an education tool. Mm-hmm. So they're using this virtual environment as an education tool. That's really cool. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, being able to actually use modern day things, things they do on an everyday basis. You know, I mean, I learned to type from, from I mean, I learned math from Math Blaster. I, know? I did type, oh, excuse me, I did typing through Mavis Beacon. Oh, yeah, and Typing of the Dead. Remember that one? I did not do that one. Oh, that was great. I killed all the zombies with all the verbs. Man. Yeah, so, yeah, there's, I mean, those are virtual environments, too. And... What, uh, yeah, I mean, like, would you also consider the idea of, like, lectures and things like that? And, like, be, and be Oh, yeah, those things? absolutely. Virtual classrooms. Um, <laughs> you know, it, again, skirts that space, whether or not it's a virtual environment, if... You know, it's just a camera in a real classroom. But I definitely think if there was, like, an avatar... And this is really interesting, too, is that they did... Um, the same guys who I mentioned earlier with the book, Jim Blaskovich uh, and Jeremy Balins, and they I, they... I don't remember which one of them did this. It was really cool, though. They did a... Um, they did a study where, uh, you know, in a classroom, they had a teacher that was an avatar. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, this avatar made eye contact with all the students in the classroom at the same time. Makes sense. Because it was an avatar and it could do that. It wasn't limited by physical limitations. I, as the teacher, look at a camera and it looks at all the students individually. And that eye contact has shown to increase engagement with students. Well, so, yeah. I mean, the idea of eye contact alone, you know? We right. stare deeply into each other's eyes every hour, every week. Yeah, we do. It's magical. It is. But yeah. (laughs) I mean, you get my point, though, right? These kids are being more engaged because they can actually interact with the the teacher at, you know, at a personal level. So that's that's really interesting. I mean, like, the the uses for that, you know? I mean, classrooms are overcrowded. Yeah. And a teacher changing a lecture and maybe even getting messages over the classroom about what they're doing and when they're doing it. That means that all you have to do is have a supervisor that someone says that is there. They are plugged in during the type of class that they're taking. Yeah, that's interesting. It's... What about? But you know, that's entertainment. But I really want to know about all the cool virtual entertainment things. I mean, I want to know how long it's going to be before I can be in my own movies. Uh, well, virtual entertainment. I mean, you know, you can. Like we said earlier, it's video games. Right. It's, you can watch a movie in a virtual environment now. Have you ever done that? I have. Is it? It's it's cool because you feel like you're in a movie theater. Uh Uh-huh. And that screen looks like it's 20 feet tall in front of you. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what's really neat... Uh-huh. What's really neat is watching 3D movies in this because you don't need glasses. You're already wearing them, and it calculates what your 3D should look like based on your position in the movie theater. Oh, that it's, is crazy! Detailed. It's really cool. There's a, there's a lot of cool things going on with entertainment, and we've covered a lot of it already. Right, right, right. One thing I want to say though, which is really cool to me, so there's this uh, there's this medical application. Okay. Yeah, you were talking about medicine being medical applications being one of those things. Right. And so so really there's kind of two areas. There's the behavioral or cognitive sort of rehabilitation aspect mm-hmm. and then there's the motor rehabilitation aspect. Um and so what I mean by this, there's the behavioral cognitive side. Let's look at that first. So okay. This is this is influencing the brain through virtual environments. So um there's, um, you know, different ways that it can help. But one of the coolest applications is uh, this sort of getting over phobias. So imagine, Billy, that you are afraid of spiders. 
Okay. Okay. I know you're not. You're a big brave man. I'm but a big brave dog. I'm a big brave dog. What are you afraid of? Let me let me ask you that. Oh, that's something I'm easy. Not, something no, easy. No, I'm not. I'm Women? not afraid of anything in particular. I'm not afraid of anything physical. Women? Let's put it that way. Women. Oh yeah, you know the women. They scare me. Please. <laughs> okay. Please. All right. You're, you're not you afraid. Saw me. I'm not afraid of anything in physical. But let's go over that. The idea. Let's say. Um. I don't know. I'm afraid of scarecrows. Okay. Let's say you're afraid of scarecrows. Right. 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 So what would happen is in this virtual behavioral cognitive therapy, what they would do is they would say, okay, here is a scarecrow, and it's. You know, six inches on a screen. Okay, are, are you okay with this? Yeah, uh, yeah. Can I show okay. this to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here's the scarecrow. It's a creepy looking scarecrow. Okay, okay. That's it. That's all we're going to say. Okay. But, you know, eventually it ramps up. They keep showing the scarecrow bigger and bigger until the person, you know, they, they wait until the they person. They get used to it. They do. And here's the crazy part. So with virtual environments and specifically virtual reality, the application with this, say you put them into a virtual environment. They're in virtual reality, and they uh-huh. see the scarecrow in front of them. Okay, yeah, That yeah, is yeah. scary as hell to someone who's afraid of scarecrows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because they've been ramping up through this virtual environment... It's the same now, concept, It's now, the same idea of what we used to do with people with fear of snakes. We would have them, or, or, or yes. animals. Now, scarecrows can't actually hurt you, but something like snakes can. Uh-huh. It's rare, but let's say... Let's use the example of snakes. This is why you would want to use a virtual environment. Because you can show them a snake, and they can reach out and touch the snake, and it won't bite back. And they can get over their fear by um, exposure to this Like thing. picking the snake up, watching it how it naturally moves, wrapping yeah. around arms and things like that. Gets close and what are the a little snoot of the boop on the snoot type of thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I saw the memes. One of the, one of the main applications is, is arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Right. Um, because they're small and they're, you know, you can emulate the touch a lot easier. Okay. Um, you basically just put a spider So we're animal. talking about people doing full on touch stuff. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. And then there's, there's this other whole side of it with like motor rehabilitation. So what this does is like for, um, uh, like someone who's suffered through a stroke or someone who has um, cerebral palsy, right? They mm-hmm. can actually put on these suits that have these reflective balls all over them. Right, right, right. like they use in like, like uh, motion, motion capture. capture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, what, what it does is the camera actually captures their body movements and they can see in a 3D environment how their body is moving and correct it accordingly. So... The the doctor can sit there with them and say, okay, do you see how your back is, is kind of hunched over? Now please lean back, and you can see the difference in your body posture. Just Live. like they always... I see. In so 3D. just like they always say, like, uh, oh, personal trainers could do the same thing. It was like you're bending... Yeah. Your, you're, you're lifting your heels. I'm not lifting my heels. Play it back on 3D. Watch it. Uh, you know, and even if they take a video of it, it's hard to see. But if they do it like that... It makes a lot more sense. Okay. Yeah. And that could be like behavioral, that could be posture, that could be a lot of things used in the medicine field. That's really exciting. That's cool. It's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. It must be expensive though. Virtual environments, much more than video games. Yeah. But I mean, like, what other things? We also like commercial use. Right. right? So so I mean, back to video games. God. <laughs> you it's- know. You it, know what the thing about it's I was thinking based about? In. It's based in. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. The idea of it is is that we're basing our whole idea of video... We, we mention the video games a lot because it's the most thing that people get the most exposure to. It is. You know, it's a consumer side of it because it was the easiest thing to produce or that makes the quickest amount of money. Right. And I mean, so like for someone who hasn't played video games since the 90s, there's, there's more... There's video games now exchange real world money all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people can actually use video games for trade. Um, you know, the, there's these uh, really expensive, hard to get items that you can actually sell to other players for yeah. real world money. Right. So they use it for commerce. You know, and like there's there's a whole group of people who farm gold and and right. and currency in these multiplayer games that will then turn around and sell it to the player base and make money off of it. And that's the thing. Like, I, I've never seen kids use Minecraft in code because I'm an older man. I mean, in entertainment, I mean, uh, in medicine and stuff like that, I've never heard of these virtual things that you're talking about. It makes sense to me, but I've never heard of them. Right. But, I mean, and so, like, the commercial side of the video games, 
people are using these things, these virtual environments, as a form of almost trade and currency. Yeah, they're using it as a job, almost. I mean, like, the famous... Have you, You've heard of Eve, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we talked about it maybe before on the show, but the biggest idea of it is is that they actually put a real-world dollar amount on a lot of the items of eve because they made it so it was a monthly thing what's crazy to me is these ships that they build in eve are like worth real world millions, thousands of dollars uh, yeah and the reason is is because you can all the actually, materials well all the materials all the time put into it yeah the idea of it is is that isk has a set price everything's generated by people and, and their isk, stock line was there isk, isk is, is the, the currency, currency okay. of the game you can even use isk to purchase real world monthly to your monthly subscription fee you can get to the point where you actually your jobs is self-sustaining to keep playing the game you play the game practically for free as long as you're doing what you're doing and you can even hire people because 99.9 percent of all the assets created in eve that the players can interact with are created by the players. players so i get what you're saying by the commercial use of of real world because if if I ever blew up one of those ships for some reason, or, or one of those thousands and thousands of all their ships, I'd be afraid for my life. Right? Someone would come and find you. There was a guy who actually had to go into hiding because he actually was in a war with another clan or corp, got to the top of it, of that corp, right? He still had people he was answering to. Rude everybody over? And he hit disband. Which shoots all the ships and shuts down all the stations in the game. I heard about this. Yes. I, I'll tell you the story, the okay. full story one of these days. But did it and knocked the whole corp out to the point that they couldn't exist anymore. That's crazy. Because if you get out of your ship, guess what I can do? Get into it. Right. It was crazy. So, yeah. And then that that's, these games like EVE, that kind of hits the social aspect as well. I mean, we kind of talked about this earlier, right? Right. With Second Life. And and just video games in general. I mean, I mean, people make a living off of social life. I mean, uh, Second Life to this day, which I do not how? understand. I yeah, don't know. It's, it's, they, oh, they make assets. They and but and then they buy them too. Obviously, obviously, because... yeah. Like I, I've never played Second Life. Have you? No. Like it seems like a novel approach, but I just. I fear the internet. Ah, there's my fear. I fear the internet. So what we'll do is we'll strap you into a virtual headset and slowly expose you to the internet. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a lot of bad stuff. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Uh, just message board after message board of anger and hate and vitriol. Uh, and memes and cat videos and oh, everything. Oh, God. I feel, like, I feel like I would be like the guy in... Um, Clockwork Orange when he's being rehabilitated. <laughs> All right, should, should we wrap this up? I think so. We're All getting right. onto a Clockwork Orange podcast. All right, so this is the part of the show where we take questions from you guys. No review today because we had so much to talk about. With Sometimes we just have a great topic, and when we have fan interaction, we rather go with that than just try to find something to review. I mean, those exactly. Who, if you like the reviews, please give us things to review as well. We'll take anything on. We just want to do what you guys want to hear. So. This is the part where we take questions from you guys, our listeners. And Billy, what is our question today? Our question comes from an email sent to us by, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, but Kirito? Kirito? Uh, Once we read the question, I think I know. Kirito writes, hey guys, I love the show so far. I'm writing to you because I recently watched an anime. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I watched an anime series called Sword Art Online. I've heard of this anime series. Uh, where the main character gets sucked into a virtual reality online role-playing game. My question is, how close do you think we are to this type of full-body immersion technology, and what kind of thing do you see it having other than... Uh, I'm sorry, what kind of things do you see it having other than video games? Thanks for the weekly laughs. Keep up the good work. Aww. Well, thanks, Kirito. I Kirito, think, that's so I it. Think it's, I think it's Kirito. Kirito. I, I've actually seen this anime that he's talking about. Uh-huh. And, uh, I mean, it makes sense because I'm a virtual reality guy. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's the You main. probably get it posted to you all the time on Facebook. Uh, every night. Yeah, yeah. It's like Star Wars. If it's yeah. virtual reality, I've already seen it, guys. But thank you for keeping me in the loop. And thanks. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, yeah. Kirito is the main character. Okay, okay, okay. So... <sighs> His question here is, how close do you think we are to this full type of immersion technology? Um, 
Well, I, I want to break this down to an idea of something I understand as well. Okay. I mean, it's the same concept, but I, I'm a big fan of Ready Player One. I've read the book many, many right. times. I have the audio book. I have the regular book. All that sort of jazz. So I have not read Ready Player One yet. It's Like I said, it's on my list. No, no. And- I want to break down like the things they need in the game to make it go, right? So the first thing they have is the visor and goggles, right? Right. So okay. And do we have that? Hold up. So, okay. In this anime mm-hmm. i don't want to call it a cartoon because some people will get offended I'm really angry about that <laughs> and we have a fan base that we adore so in this I anime them. in this anime um they basically what happens is they have this headset uh-huh right that plugs in neurally to their the base of their spine does it plug into the base of their spine it literally plugs into the base of their spine jesus and it takes over all their senses so the idea is that instead of brain signals going to the rest of your body, this intercepts it and then interprets those signals into inputs to this game. Where are these kids' parents that let them get implants like that? But go on. So there's that aspect of it. And, right. then, and then in reverse, there's feedback that comes from the game and inputs it into neural signals. Um, and their brain then perceives it because all, all of our sensory input, and we got to do an episode on sensory uh, systems, but it all comes through our spinal cord. Right. Okay. So, this... so it's it's grounded sort of in in fact. Right. 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 Um, and so I don't know if we necessarily have the technology the technology to do that. Right. The human brain is so difficult to even get. An understanding of like the most basic parts, right? Are, and are, and tapping into that spine day in day out for entertainment or even well, okay, hang on. There's before you before you go too far. There's no, no. This, I mean even other uses. There's this really sadistic sort of twist to this this show is that if you die in the virtual environment, it fries your neural signal. It's some sadistic. I love guy my play. I love I love okay. our fans and our people. But what the hell are you people watching? Hey, I watched it too. <laughs> I watched it too. So anyway, there's there's this creator who's like really sadistic, and he you know if you die in the game, you die in real life, and he locks everybody in. He turns off the log out button so you can't get out. Ugh. It's a great it's a great series. I would imagine so. It's going to be on my watch list just if I feel cruel and mean. No, it's, but I mean I, it's I get good. what you're it's saying. Good. It's good. But I mean like you have like. In my idea, you have the goggle, you have the things. Right. We don't have the cerebral implant that you know of yet. Right. And then we usually have the force feedbacks, but if we take that out, we would have to have, like, a haptic suit. Yes, yeah. So there's there's this other sort of, I guess, pie-in-the-sky idea that we can take these pills that have nanobots in them. What? That I know that sort of attach to our neurotransmitters mm-hmm. throughout the body and do effectively the same thing. I think nanobots are a little bit in the future in science fictiony, but I mean they're they're on their way, right? I, I would imagine nanobots. that we would try to cure disease with nanobots before we came up with the idea of how to make yourself feel like you're being touched in a virtual. Oh gosh, I went down a dark road with that you. Did line. you did? I'm going back up from that line and being like. Before we come up with nanobots to make a feedback thing for your body. Yeah, and so, you know, in, in terms of how far out we are, I don't know. Because we're we're constantly coming up with new technologies, right, that, that sort of get at these multimodal, mm-hmm. right, uh, ways of interacting with virtual virus. I think we're a long way off from human brain interfaces. Well, um, I mean... This might be, like, very top-down idea of it, but we have that um, way of, like, those 4D, uh, see, like, rides that we always see. Where, you know, like Star Tours. Right. Where there's wind blasting and there's sparks flying and, the, and then there's movement and gyration. I mean, isn't that kind of a form of, like, forced feedback that we could utilize? I mean, mind you, that would be stupid expensive to have in your home, but... Uh, I'm working on it, first off. <laughs> Um, You're but, working on mechs. You're always working on no, mechs. No, no, no. I'm working on putting that full immersion into my home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those systems I want to have. I want to come over like, and hang out yeah. with that guy. I want a simulator with the hydraulics and everything. Anyway, uh, no, but I, I think what the, the listener's getting at here is this, this sort of not doing, like, the bare minimum and having the environment come to you, mm-hmm. right? Instead of you building up this environment around you and still having it simulate 
this like Star Tours, you're in a, a ship. Right, you're not interacting with it, but I meant like it's still a yeah. 3D environment. I mean, you're you're in a, it's not a virtual environment because it's real around you. The screen is what's beyond the screen is a virtual world. Right. But you are not in that virtual world yourself. I mean, it's virtual reality in the sense that you are interacting with it because you're watching it. There's I don't know. This is the sign you can see of of Nick falling down a logic case of stairs into more deeper topics than to get into. Oh, God, there's so many to talk about. There's so much to go into. But I think, like, I would really love to get to that point. I just don't know if we're capable of that lawnmower man level of virtual reality. We have to wait and see. So, Kirito, to answer your question, I don't know. But, oh my God, would it be so cool to do that? I mean, we all dream about that. Every day. I mean, I would love to be able to actually pilot a virtual mech, you know? Have the gyrations and be in there and get out of the cockpit and fight a dude. I want, I, I, I'm really excited for Star Wars VR. Like the, oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The X-Wing Are you mission. sure you didn't get really upset about the idea of, like, uh, Star Wars Connect? You know, where you could do the solo? Okay. Yeah, do, yeah. All right, let's not bring that. Okay, that's a good place to end for today. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for today. If you guys want to be featured on the show, we're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook. We're on Twitter as well. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all of your questions. Be sure to like and follow us on all the social media, too. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics you want us to talk about on the show. I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn.com slash Nick Rome with two O's. Billy Hall, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter at Comstar Cleric. That's uh, Comstar Cleric. It only has one O, but I still feel special. All Have right. a great day. Thanks again for listening to us here on Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.